So today we're going to talk about how to go a lot faster without spending any money. Now that's probably a really good idea. Uh, we're going to talk about performance alignment. Now um, this is like alignment just purely for grip and speed around the course. If you uh, align your car like this and drive around every day, you're going to wear your tires out really quick. And you might have some funny driving characteristics like pull and stuff. So, you know, if you're one of those people that want um, hands-free driving and uh, want your tires to last forever, don't watch any farther. But if you want to go fast, uh, go fast for free, come on, let's uh, talk about some stuff. The first thing I'm going to talk about is camber because it's a controversial subject. Uh, it's mostly a lot of performance guys make fun of those hella flush guys and uh, those stance people, but uh, this has nothing to do with that. That's your own personal choice. Now, uh, camber uh, can really make a huge difference in how your car grips. Uh, we're mostly going to be talking about negative camber here because uh, in just about all cases, uh, especially in the front of the car, uh, more negative camber means more grip, less understeer, and faster lap times. Now, when I'm talking about negative camber, it's uh, the tires tilting in inwards like this. Now, this is super exaggerated, but um, uh, it's really tilting in, and it's more to make a point. So, this is negative camber. This is positive camber, and you hardly ever do positive camber on anything. I can only think of one time where you would and we'll get into that. So the reason why negative camber gives you more grip is because when you're in a corner and uh, putting lateral load on the tire, the tire distorts and it puts a lot of load on the outside shoulder and it lifts the inside shoulder. A lot of this could be uh, dependent on what kind of tire, how stiff the sidewall is, what kind of belts you have, how stiff the belts are, uh, whether you're a radial or a bias ply tire. Now almost all tires nowadays are radials, but there's some slicks that are still bias ply. Um, so these are all factors in well, why camber helps you. Um, most people know that are enthusiasts know about the uh, tire distortion and compensating for uh, shoulder load and inside lift. But there's another factor, it's called camber thrust. Now when you're in the corner, and like let's say you're developing um, some cornering angle and you're transferring weight to your outside and the tire is starting to distort, um, the force that uh, it takes to distort the carcass of the tire creates a uh, um, a moment to the inside, and this is called camber thrust. Depending on how much camber you're running, this can be uh, you know, up to 500 pounds of force pushing your car inward to the turn. And that's one of the reasons why when you run more negative camber, the car turns in better and more crisply. You're getting more grip through um, contact patch under lateral load and camber thrust. Now, how much negative camber do you run? Um, I would say like your modern performance radial tire that's DOT rated, um, it's anywhere from like three and a half to four and a half degrees negative generally. Now there's exceptions. Some tires like less, some like more, but it's going to be in that window. Like if you have stiffer sidewalls, um, like a branded tire with stiffer sidewalls, it's going to be less. If you have a more flexy tire, it'll be more. If you have a really low profile tire, it'll be less. If you have a really tall sidewall, it'll be more. Uh, if you have a McPherson strut style suspension that uh, doesn't gain negative camber under, under roll, you're going to need more negative camber. If you have a multi-link or unequal length A-arm uh, suspension that has more camber gain under compression or roll, uh, then you're going to need less. So you're going to have to mess around a little bit and see what works. But generally, um, you know, like what I found is uh, between three and four and a half degrees for most tires. Um, that's in the front. In the rear, I run anywhere from one and three quarter to, um, uh, you know, up to four degrees negative, depending on the kind of car. Like a rear heavy car, like a Porsche, it's going to be closer to four. 
um, like a front wheel drive car, it's going to be closer to one and three quarter. A lot of rear wheel drive cars, uh, you run less too. So typically in a rear wheel drive track car, it's something around two degrees negative. Sometimes it's a little less depending on uh, how the car is using the tire. The tuning and the determining how much camber to run is the subject of a whole nother video that I'll do later. Uh, but you can kind of tell, like if the corner outside edge of the tire is getting uh, chewed up, you need more negative camber. Um, if most of your wear is on the inside and you're hardly touching the outside, then uh, a little less. Negative camber also lets you run like a tire pressure that gets you more mechanical grip and kind of more um, what the tire manufacturer's recommendation is. Like before, uh, in the old days, we would run a lot of tire pressure, but this is uh, when tires were more flexible and suspension was crappier. Uh, sometimes we'd run 50 PSI in the front tires to prevent the tire from rolling over and tearing out the outside corner. But when you run negative camber, you can run a lower pressure and uh, not do that and get take advantage of laying out the contact patch more at the bottom and getting more mechanical grip. Typically, you can run between most uh, street DOT radial performance tires like anywhere from 28 to 35 PSI. Uh, you can rely on what your manufacturer recommends or do a little testing, but you get the combination of tire pressure and negative camber. Uh, it makes a huge difference. You'll go a lot faster. Like anything, it's possible to overdo the negative camber. So, like I said, if you see like you're running up only on the inside, yeah, I'd probably back it off some. Also, um, if you're running slicks, uh, slicks are highly brand dependent when it comes to how much negative camber they like. Uh, you get a slick like a Yokohama, uh, it likes almost as much camber as a street tire. Uh, there's other ones like Michelin's that have super stiff sidewalls and you might find yourself running a little bit uh, less negative camber than you would on a uh, DOT tire. Uh, some tires like Hoosiers and I think not all Hoosiers but some Hoosiers and maybe a few other slick manufacturers they're still bias ply and if you're running a bias ply slick they usually like a little bit less camber than a radial, radial one well. So that kind of covers uh, camber. There's maybe a couple of times that you want to do weird things with camber. Um, both of them are regarding drift cars. Drift cars have so much angle uh, in the uh, suspension geometry, uh, steering angle, that uh, they get really bad uh, caster tilt. So uh, the, the tires will be kind of going like, like this in the turn. Now in the drift car, um, it's kind of the opposite tire that you need to get grip. So when you're in drift, you're kind of like this and your outside tire is totally on the outside corner and you're ripping up that corner and that's actually your higher weighted corner in drift. So a lot of times you'll run a lot of negative camber on the drift car just to help your outside counter steered tire get more grip. You know, like if it tilts too much, the front washes out while you're drifting. And, you know, if you drift, you know that's no good. So that's why you see drift cars a lot of times. They have five, six, seven, eight, even 10 degrees of negative camber. And that's to compensate for what happens when you're uh, at a lot of opposite lock. The other thing in a drift car is sometimes in the rear, you might run a little bit of positive camber. Uh, it's because like a well set up drift car with a lot of power generally has pretty soft suspension and when they get on the power uh, the car squats and if you have a multi-link type rear suspension you get negative camber gain under compression but uh, drift cars they're on the throttle all the time and they're squatted to some degree um, through a lot of the course so a lot of times, like on a drift car, we'll run a little bit of positive camber uh, to plant the tire flatter while we're squatted uh, and in drift under power. So these are like maybe two weird exceptions to adjustments, but um, you know, adjustments are free. And uh, 
it doesn't cost you any money and don't be afraid to experiment. The next thing that goes with camber is toe settings. Now, uh, generally in the front, uh, in performance applications, we always set the car toe out to some degree. And uh, this goes the same whether it's front wheel drive, rear wheel drive, front engine, rear engine, mid engine. Um, toe out is kind of like pigeon toed where you uh, adjust your suspension so it's like pointing out like this. Now, um, toe in is uh, this. Um, usually you want to run toe in in the rear, but toe out in the front. Toe out uh, helps counteract some of the uh, force on the tire caused by camber thrust. So when you're going in the straight line, um, if you're running a little toe out, it, it counteracts the, the pushing in force from the camber thrust. So you actually get a little bit uh, better tire wear, tires run a little cooler, and um, uh, you get less rolling resistance by towing out. I mean, this seems counterintuitive, but uh, it really works. Um, and it's a really good way to combat the camber thrust in a straight line. Uh, the other thing tow out does is it kind of helps the car uh, turn in better. And uh, if you can get the car turned in and rotated, you're less likely to go into understeer. Um, so that's a good thing. You know, like anything else, uh, you can overdo it. Now, like a, a rear engine car, like a Porsche or a mid-engine car, like a uh, Ferrari or something, uh, you don't need to run too much tow out. So the most you would probably run in these kind of cars, unless there's some weird situation you're trying to tune around, is about an eighth inch out. Um, generally, a rear wheel drive front engine car, you want to do about an eighth inch out in the front and uh, maybe sometimes as much as uh, three eighths. A front wheel drive car is a little bit of an exception because the torque um, a lot of times will make the car tend to tow in um, because of uh, the way the front suspension is loaded. So a front wheel drive car, generally you want to run a minimum of one eighth inch tow out and you can run up to a half inch generally on some of these cars. Generally, I found that going more than um, three eighths is diminishing returns on a front wheel drive car, but uh, I've run as much as a half inch um, depending on the car and the brand of tires and stuff. So to out your friend, um, you might want to double think doing some of this stuff on your street car because negative camber and tow out uh, make the car susceptible to the crown of the road. Now racetracks are generally kind of flatter, but um, the highway has a crown to help with water drainage. So if you're running tow out and negative camber, the car wants to follow the crown of the road. So you're going to get a uh, wheel pull going down the freeway. And anytime you're going down in the straight line, you're not going to be able to just let go of the wheel and the car probably won't track super straight. Like it'll tend to follow the crown of the road. It'll also be, um, tram line sensitive so if there's like grooves in the road those water grooves the, car, the steering will tend to want to follow that or if there's railroad tracks crossing the road in an angle or you know any kind of uh, feature in the pavement like that the car is going to want to follow it um, generally when you're racing uh, you're totally paying attention and racetracks uh, generally don't have those kind of things so it's not going to bother you but uh, if you're commuting every day to work, it might be annoying. The other thing is that uh, these performance alignment settings tend to chew up the inside of your tires when you're not going fast. Now, when you're on the track, uh, you're using more of your tires, so your tires will last longer. But in daily commuting, yeah, it's gonna chew up your tires quicker. How much depends on uh, your car. Now, I've had like, uh, like my daily driver Honda and I drive every day with a race alignment settings and my tires last 30,000 miles. Uh, it's mostly because the car is so light and it doesn't have that much power. But um, uh, like a really heavy car, like some of your new performance sedans, uh, it might have a marked um, effect on wear. And like something like a Tesla, I mean, it'll have a big effect on how the tires wear. Uh, a lot of it's because how Tesla's 
have a lot of initial torque when getting off the line and uh, they chew up their tires real quick. Now for the rear, um, you almost always want to tow in. Uh, there's one exception and that's kind of a rare exception, but let's talk about the common things. So uh, most cars, you want to run like um, a little tow in in the rear. Uh, generally, uh, an eighth inch total tow in is perfectly safe. Uh, some cars with like trailing arm suspensions like uh, BMWs um, up to the E46 or your old Datsun 510s, uh, anything with a trailing arm or a semi-trailing arm, those suspensions tow out under compression and uh, they can get kind of crazy sometimes and uh, the tow out can cause like uh, trailing throttle oversteer and stuff when you don't suspect it. So uh, on these kind of cars, you want to run probably about a quarter inch tow in minimum and sometimes like a half inch and sometimes even more. So a lot of it depends on how stiff your suspension is, how much the car rolls, uh, how much tow out does the car gain under compression. So generally, uh, one eighth of an inch total is good and you know up to sometimes three quarters of an inch depending on how your suspension geometry is. Um, you know, don't be afraid to experiment. Uh, the, like I said, the adjustments are free, but um, you know, pay attention, and especially uh, semi-trailing arm cars. Every once in a while, too, you get a multi-link car that, uh, that tows out under compression, too, and that can benefit from more uh, static tow-in tow adjustment. So, yeah, like if you have um, uh, some situations like, uh, like let's say the car tends to uh, like get sideways on corner exit when you're applying the throttle, um, a little toe, more toe in can mellow that out and let you get in the gas harder sooner and drop your lap times. Uh, if the car is really squirrely at the limit, um, a little toe in can, uh, can help uh, settle it down. Of course, don't go overboard, but don't be afraid to experiment. Now, when it comes to toe out, there's certain situations that are very limited why you, why you want to run rear toe out in, in the back. Uh, you know, generally it makes the car feel really unstable, which is uh, no good. I think where you want to do it is, um, if let's say you have a front wheel drive uh, car, and let's say it's an understeering pig and you're running uh, SCCA autocross where you're not allowed to do anything. Like let's say you're running stock class. Uh, like a trick that maybe can get the car to rotate is run a little toe out like an eighth inch. I mean, I've run up to a quarter inch rear toe out in front wheel drive cars in autocross. Um, also, if you rally race one of these cars and uh, you got to get to rotate on the dirt. A little toe out in the rear can sometimes help the car come around a lot better. Um, this is about the only time you'd ever want to run rear toe out, uh, at least that I can think of or I've ever tried it. Um, if you do it on any other kind of car, uh, it makes things pretty wild, so I generally wouldn't do that. Now, most cars uh, are easily adjustable for tow. Um, almost, I mean, I can't think of a car that you can't adjust tow, but uh, camber um, can be a little bit of a problem. So you wanna make sure that you at least have some rudimentary tools for adjusting camber at home. Now, I like to use the smart camber gauge. It doesn't cost too much um, and it's easy, but you could do something similar with like a piece of angle aluminum and a, a digital level that you can buy at uh, Home Depot or something. You know, that'll help you measure the camber and get you consistent from side to side. Um, a little trick on the McPherson strut car that's not adjustable is, um, is uh, you can slot the ears on the strut. Now, this is a high buck KW racing um, strut, but you notice that the uh, upper upper strut mounting hole is slotted. Uh, this is so you can adjust it 
camber at the bottom and that way you can have consistent kingpin angle like you use the camera plate to adjust the kingpin inclination and just camber on the bottom and that's kind of an advanced thing but um, you know you could do this at home you just get a die grinder and oval out the um, upper or lower don't do both holes because that's an overkill but just do the top or or, or the bottom depending on what, what it's e what's easier to get a wrench on and just take a little bit out. I mean, like an eighth inch makes a big difference when it comes to adjusting your camber. Now I like to do this more than doing something like camber bolts because I found that on most cars, camber bolts slip and you know that's no good if you're hauling ass and your suspension starts moving around. But I've never had the combination of uh, stock bolts and slot slip ever, um, even with sticky tires, even on the track. So that's like a cheap pro tip. So the last thing we're going to talk about is caster. Caster is something that a lot of people have trouble wrapping their heads around. Uh, I'll make it real simple for you. So caster is basically um, a straight line going through the center of the wheel down to the ground and another line going from the top of your McPherson strut uh, through the uh, lower ball joint to the ground. In the case of a strut car, if it's a car with an equal length A-arms, uh, it's a line going through your ball joints, upper and lower, uh, to the ground. So you get some points here. Um, now, you have your point from the uh, center of your tire to the ground where your contact patch is and you have your other one it's basically the line that the uh, front suspension pivots upon when you're steering so it's a virtual line going through the pivot points of your suspension to the ground and uh, we call that the Dave point now the Dave points named after Dave Coleman who came up with a name for the Dave point after with all this research, found that there's no engineering name for it. So when you understand all these relationships, then you can have a bit of understanding of how caster works. Uh, basically, uh, when you steer the car, the tire pivots upon this point that goes through your steering points of your suspension down to the Dave point. Now the distance, uh, from the Dave point to where your center of your contact patch is, uh, your straight line going to the ground, uh, that is like your trail. Now that acts just like a caster, hence the name caster. So your tire is pivoting about this, your tire is there, and that acts like a lever arm that makes your, uh, your tires want to go back straight. So it gives you a self-steering. I guess you could call this trail. That's what a lot of people call it. Um, so we can call it the mic line or something, and then I'll, I'll be famous too. But um, caster is not adjustable in a lot of cars, but if you have a race car or your car is set up, uh, you probably have it set up to adjust caster. Now, you need caster to give you self-steer. So what that is, is when you turn, it's that tendency of the wheel to return to center. So the more caster, the more self-steer you have. Uh, let go of the wheel when you're turned and the car will self-center. So caster gives you straight line stability. Um, you know, if you're a drifter, the self-steer helps you like uh, transition and stuff like that quicker. Another thing caster does that's good is it helps give you more negative camber on your outside front wheel. Uh, that's the highly loaded one. So this helps reduce understeer and improve turn-in. So if some caster's good, it's possible to overdo things. Uh, too much caster can make your steering effort too high. Uh, this is because you're kind of uh, tilting the, everything at an angle like a chopper and you're actually raising and lowering the front of the car while you're turning it because you're tilting the contact patch. Um, this can also cause too much negative camber on the outside wheel. Um, so you tilt it, uh, you're running a lot of static negative and you'll get too much, you'll get a sun and understeer. Um, too much of this uh, tilt while the wheel's turning will also screw up your uh, corner weight. So the weight will transfer diagonally across the chassis 
and you can end up with something that understeers and goes into sudden oversteer. So excessive uh, caster can cause uh, corner weight jacking, which is no good. Uh, finally, on like a finally on an all-wheel drive vehicle uh, or a front-wheel drive vehicle, uh, too much caster, too much distance here. It acts like a lever arm, so the uh, steering axis to uh, contact patch uh, can act like a lever arm, and that can contribute to torque steer. And the torque steer can get really out of hand if you go too crazy with it. So some general guidelines if you want to mess around with caster in your car is front-wheel drive, all-wheel drive, don't exceed 4 degrees. Generally, don't exceed 6 degrees. If you have wide tires, uh, don't exceed four. And if you have a drift car, I wouldn't exceed six. Remember, some's good, more's better, too much is way bad. If you like this content, be sure to subscribe to our channel. Um, give us some likes, that always helps us in the algorithm. Go to MotoIQ.com, check out our website. We have years and years of technical articles. Uh, you can enjoy yourself. I mean, there's literally probably thousands of art technical articles there. Um, if you like uh, my shirt, now we have merch. You can go to Moto IQ, hit the shop button, uh, go to our web store, buy, buy our shirts, and uh, shoot, we have a whole thing. You can buy parts, and all of your purchases help support us and create more content. If you want us to work on your car, hit the garage services link and uh, tell us what you want and uh, we'll get back to you. So until next time, have fun, experiment, go faster.